tales for dark nights. The Hooded Stranger Written by Greg Jones Narrated by Otis Jiry This story is dedicated to Carla Martin. The intensity of the moon's luminescence belied the darkness of the night. Shadows cast by the once formerly inanimate trees, walls, and hedgerows were given a form of life that glared at me from under the twilight blanket and silently followed my path home, leaving an impenetrable darkness in their wake. This was the inevitable culmination of my selfishness and self-loathing. My sins had finally caught up with me. Like a criminal being paraded before obeying public, I could hear their inaudible whispers of my judgment and denunciation dancing on the cold breeze. Whether what I was sensing was a distorted perception of reality as a result of yet another night of lonesome drinking, rather than a reflection of my true experience is impossible to say. Besides, isn't the validity of our experiences only as true as our perceptions of them? Although perception can be flawed, the validation of our experience remains defined by our beliefs in these perceptions to be true. With this being the case, how many varied and contradictory true perceptions must there be? Such pseudo-philosophical insights had become more commonplace and were a welcome alternative to the thoughts that would typically demand my attention. No matter how much I would try to bury the memories and thoughts of my indiscretions, they would always resurface to cloud my mind. Tonight, like every other night, recollections of my misdemeanors were threatening to overwhelm me. I was torn by having not seen my best friend Graham since his diagnosis, my unrelenting mistreatment of my wife, and the continued neglect of my daughter. At this point, I hasten to add, I had not always been this way. I was once a thoughtful, loving, and attentive husband, a devoted father, and a loyal friend. However, the tragedy that befell me and my wife all but extinguished the qualities that I once had used to define myself. Any residual characteristics had perished long ago along with my sense of identity. The man I had to face in the mirror each morning was not the man I, nor anyone close to me, recognized. I was in possession of a body of which I forfeited ownership of, only death could free my pitiful soul from the shackles of this spiritual incarceration. It would be remiss not to acknowledge my wife was also, if not more, affected than I, but she dealt with her grief far more constructively. While she would go out and seek comfort in her friends, I would neglect mine and sit alone with a bottle of scotch looking for an excuse to blame the world and all those who shared my cursed existence for my misfortune where she would try to talk to me about what we had suffered. I would withdraw more and more into myself, so that our once expressive and free-flowing conversations would consist of nothing more than a few murmurs of acknowledgement on my part. I missed how we would talk for hours about nothing, how we felt with the mere power of words any problem could be solved. I missed how we would talk and plan for the future. What I missed most of all was how our future was once something to look forward to. Yet, now all I could see was continued depression of my existence. Words that once provided solace now tore open rather than healed old wounds. All I was and all I had achieved had been scarred by the tragedy we had suffered. Although some will tell you that tragedy should bring a family together, this tragedy was slowly tearing our family apart, and I was the sole architect in the continued downward spiral of our lives. I could no longer even look at my 14-year-old daughter in the eyes as she reminded me of her lost little brother. The little brother she vowed she was old enough to care for when we had to rush to the hospital to see my sick father. The little brother she allowed to wander alone through the nearby woods to the bridge overlooking the river. 
the little brother she saw too late leaning too far over the side of the bridge. The little brother she helplessly watched topple over the edge and fall into the cold, murky depths, never to resurface. The pain that comes with losing a child is the most unbearable pain one can ever experience, and it is a pain no one should ever have to endure. When Tom, this is the first and only time I will be able to bring myself to say his name, was born, he completed our family. His birth symbolized the advent of the complete fulfillment and contentment of our lives. His loss demonstrated how brittle our contentment was. I was kept awake by my mind's insistence on torturing itself with imaginings of his suffering as I restlessly lay next to my sleeping wife. I was haunted by the imagined sounds of his screams as he fell into the watery abyss. I forced myself to imagine how afraid he must have been as the icy water hit his little body and the river enveloped his tiny form. I wish I could have known his final thoughts, as he was stolen from the world of the living and his loving family. Denial is an amazing thing. I used irrational logic to maintain the hope that he had not died in that river, that perhaps death would realize its mistake and deliver him back to me. I needed to believe that he was living happily in some underwater kingdom, beliefs most likely inspired by the bedtime stories I would read him as he sat wearily on my lap before falling asleep against my chest. His bedtime routine was always the same. I would read to him until he fell asleep, and then gently carrying him up to his bedroom, making sure to wake him in the process. However fanciful my rational mind knew these beliefs to be, I needed the hope that he would be returned back into my arms. It was only when his lifeless body was dredged up from the riverbed that the last embers of hope that warmed my heart died. It was only then that I was forced to accept his passing. Since that day, I have lost more and more of myself until I became a mere shell haunted by memories of both loss and happiness. The happy memories tortured me the most, as I believed these were memories of a time I could never again experience. My self-indulgent pity was interrupted as I shuddered with a sudden and distinct feeling of unease. I looked about me to realize that the night was now so dark I could barely see in front of me. I turned around to face the path I had walked to find myself confronted by a soul-piercing blackness that, to my irrational mind, felt like it was observing and following my passage home. The acuteness of my sudden unease forced me to sober up, and without the comforting haze of intoxication, I became distinctly aware of how alone and exposed I was. I decided to hurry onwards to escape the seemingly relentless envelopment of the shadows. Even the normally reliable moon's luminescence seemed futile in the face of darkness that seemed to be poised to crash around me. I looked up to the sky and observed the moon hiding behind the clouds, consciously abandoning me to my fate. As the darkness closed in on me, I began to panic. I tried to outrun it, but no matter how fast I ran, it tauntingly followed close behind me. This macabre game of cat and mouse was brought to an unceremonious end as my right foot hit something sticking out of the ground and sent me sprawling. I hit the ground hard, and the fall left me breathless. While I lay on the ground trying to catch my breath, I sensed a sudden coldness closing in around me. There was a presence in the darkness. In my helpless state, all I could do was close my eyes expectantly, fully at the mercy of my dark companion. I lay there for what felt like hours until I gathered enough courage to open my eyes. I noticed that I was now surrounded by woodland. I must have gotten completely disoriented and in my panic ended up in the nearby woods. My disquiet soon returned as I realized that I was now surrounded by the very darkness I had tried to evade. As I stood up and brushed myself down, I experienced a lightheadedness that 
overcame me to such an extent that I had to support myself against a nearby tree. The dizzying sensation was accompanied by the bizarre feeling of something being extracted, or rather sucked from within me. As the darkness around me continued to grow, I realized that the darkness that was following me was one with the darkness that lay within me, hidden. The dark secrets I kept tethered beneath the surface were drawn to the obscurity that slowly crept about me. The only thing that pierced the silent, looming wave of melancholy was the muted screams of my sins. Boldly and proudly boasting of what had previously kept me in shameful bondage, my hidden secrets, which were safely locked, lost and forgotten in the crevice of time, were magnetically drawn to the black curtain that had fallen around me and were extracted with such force that I had no control over their disclosure. A fear I had never before experienced circled me like a tiger stalks its prey, mocking me with its faceless anonymity. I knew not what I was afraid of, Perhaps not knowing what I was fearful of, yet sensing the need to be afraid, was what filled me with the growing terror I was now experiencing. I looked about me for some escape for the gathering night and saw a familiar clearing no more than twenty yards ahead. The path to this clearing was the only one that wasn't obstructed by the darkness, which by now was all but upon me. I steadied myself and ran for the clearing. It wasn't until the clearing came into focus that I realized why this clearing was so familiar to me. I stopped in my tracks as I saw what lay ahead. Beyond the clearing lay a bridge, twenty feet above the river's waterline. It was the same bridge from which my son had fallen, and the same river that had taken him from me all those months ago. I came to my senses too late to notice the darkness once more creeping up behind me. Before I could react, it was upon me, and I was trapped by its cold embrace. This night hunter had stalked and successfully captured its prey. Having caught and incarcerated its victim in its gloomy prison, it proceeded to inject every misdeed, sadness, sorrow, regret, and sin into my unfortunate captured soul. This was an enforced overdose of everything every man strives to forget and seek absolution for. The conglomeration of these sensations overcame me until I became nothing more than a vessel for grief. I was inexplicably drawn to the bridge overlooking the river, still surrounded by the darkness that obscured my vision like an esoteric veil. Once on the bridge, the darkness that had fallen around me was accompanied by an eerie stillness. Even the sound of the gushing water below was hushed. This did not go unnoticed on my part. This ominous tranquility was at odds with my emotions. I sensed the anticipation that exuded from my surroundings. I knew that the reason for this deathly stillness would soon become apparent. My now erstwhile feelings of fear, anxiety, and sorrow were replaced with a resignation to my fate. Enveloped by the ubiquitous tide of night, I looked at the deceptively calm waters below. I was all too aware of the strength of the currents below, its serene surface, and even though I was a fair swimmer, I knew that if I were to fall or jump in from this height, I would be dragged beneath current. I closed my eyes and grimaced as I once again relived what my son must have felt on that fateful day. I could only imagine the fear and helplessness he must have felt as he fell toward the water below. Was he hoping, praying, or pleading for me to rescue him? I fervently hoped he would have forgiven me and understood why I could not be there for him in this hour of need. I often asked myself if he felt betrayed by my broken promises to protect him, or whether his innocence and purity spared him from such feelings of resentment. The day I lost my son was not the first time that the river had made its unwelcome presence felt in my life. Thirty years prior to my son's accident, Graham and I had been skimming rocks across the water's surface as we sat on the riverbank. 
We would compete to see who could skim their rock the farthest. Graham always had a knack of skimming his rock farther than I could, so in this instance, I decided to change my technique to give myself more leverage by bringing myself to a crouching position. As I brought myself to stand, I slipped and fell down the riverbank into the water. I was only ten at the time and unable to swim. When I fell into the water, I couldn't bring myself to surface. My first emotion was panic, but as consciousness slipped away from me, uh, I felt acceptance. This was until I felt something pull me out of the water and drag me out of the riverbank. Graham had jumped in after me and swam to my rescue. He saved my life that day, and we had been inseparable ever since. In the last few months, I had questioned if my life being spared all those years ago was the reason for my son's death. Perhaps the river wanted my life and feeling cheated, consequently waited for the next opportunity to take me, or failing that, someone I loved. Perhaps my son was a casualty of a vindictive form of universal balance. It is relevant to state here that the reason for me not seeing my sick friend to whom I owe my life is not due to some irrational blame laid at his door. The reason I hadn't seen him was due in no small part to my cowardice. I simply did not feel I had the strength to see my dearest friend in such a sorry state. I did not know how I would react or even if I could stand to see him looking so unwell. Looking at the water below, feelings of sorrow and despair now came flooding back to me with a vengeance. The river seemed a source of escape rather than an adversary. I thought how easy it would be if I were to just climb over the edge, close my eyes, and jump. Surely it would all happen so fast that before I knew it I would be back with my son, so I could explain why I wasn't there for him. My wife would understand. She may even welcome my demise. Our marriage, along with our civility towards one another, had been in decline since the tragedy. I had become more brutish in my demeanor to her, and on more than one occasion I am ashamed to admit that I raised my hand to her. What's worse is that I had started to subject my daughter to the same mistreatment my wife had so far endured with such transcendent dignity. It had got to the point where she would not even leave me alone with her as she couldn't trust my temper. She would have left me long ago were it not for her continued belief that I may once again become the man she fell in love with. There were times I would try to recapture what I once felt for my wife, but now... When I thought of her, all the noise and words that used to accompany these thoughts were simply no longer there. The corner of my mind where she once lived was now nothing more than an empty space. I still remembered those feelings, I still reminisced, but the silence that accompanied these musings was a testament to her vacancy. It was an eerie silence cold and unsettling, a confirmation of what was lost. However much I tried to rediscover the devotion I once felt, it seemed a lifetime away. Eventually I stopped trying and accepted that her dry tears would be the stains that would define what our relationship had become. I was brought back to the present by a self-loathing so consuming me that I saw no reason not to end my torturous existence. I climbed over the edge of the bridge and looked at the water below. My heart thumped against my chest as I began to question if I had the nerve to do the unthinkable. If I didn't do it now, then perhaps I never would. I looked around me to make sure no one was about. I didn't want a good Samaritan taking me out of what I felt I had to do. I lowered my body over the edge of the bridge until my legs dangled precariously. I took one last look around to be sure of no interruptions and a deep breath as I began to rock my body to and fro so I could propel myself far enough away from the bridge so that I could take a clean descent into the water below. I closed my eyes tightly and prepared to let go. But as soon as I had determined to release my grip, I heard a voice 
from behind me. It was distant and quiet, yet nevertheless distinguishable. The voice was deep and soothing, its pronunciation deliberate and its vernacular slow and measured. Now is not your time. I froze. Surely I, I must be hearing things. How could it be possible for someone to be there without me being aware of their approach? I sat on the bridge, motionless, waiting to hear it again, but I heard nothing. It didn't occur to me to turn around, which was most likely due to the fact that if I turned around, I would have lost my nerve and climbed down from the bridge ledge altogether. I went through the same routine as before, and just like before, as soon as I prepared to propel myself into the river below, I heard the same voice speaking the same words, only louder. Now is not your time. I definitely heard it that time. It came from almost directly behind me. What disturbed me above all else was that I was totally unaware of its presence until this point. I reluctantly turned to face the origin of the voice, and I was confronted by the sight of a person dressed in a hooded, ecclesiastic garment. The only feature I could make out was his pallid hands, but I couldn't see below the hood to make out his facial features. I say his because I could tell by the body shape and sound of the voice that the figure stood before me was male. I was shaken at the apparent sudden manifestation of this hooded stranger, and I was not put any more at ease by the fact that I couldn't see his face due to the low hood. I decided the best way to deduce who this person was was to engage in some form of conversation. The obvious question was related to his introductory statement. What do you mean now is not my time? Now is not your time, he repeated. Clearly this reproach was getting me nowhere. I couldn't avoid feeling self-conscious at being sat on a bridge ledge facing the stranger, so I decided to climb down and talk in a more orthodox fashion. Do I know you? I asked. I am a friend. It was as vague as the first response, but at least this was somebody I knew, which made me feel a little more at ease. Okay, so, this is so your friend. Would you care to divulge which friend you are? I am just a friend. It is all you need to know. I paused to think which friends I had with such limited social skills. I could not recount having or even desiring a friend who seemed to lack the ability to answer the simplest of questions. However, my train of thought was interrupted when he stated, Walk with me. This was more of a command rather than a request, and with my curiosity at its peak, I complied. I know about how unhappy you've been. I know how you've been taking it out on those who do not deserve your mistreatment, he continued. In any other situation, if someone started stating facts about me and my life, yet had no way of knowing them, I would try to get away from that person as soon as I possibly could. Yet in this instance, despite our admittedly limited conversation, he exuded a certain knowledge and wisdom which made me feel comfortable with him, having the knowledge he had. At the time, I hadn't noticed it, but looking back, I realized that my feelings of anxiety, sorrow, self-loathing, and fear had all but abandoned me, and I felt relaxed and content in the company of this self-proclaimed friend. I found myself talking about my mistreatment of my wife, children, and friends, yet with each revelation the figure seemed impassive, not to the point of indifference, but he had no judgment of me or what I had done, and this served for me to tell him more. The more I revealed, the more I got the underlying impression that he was already aware of everything I was telling him. Although the conversation was admittedly one way, it was the most liberating and beneficial conversation I had had since the passing of my son. Talking with this hooded stranger had provided me with a strange form of absolution. Time had flown by. I must have been speaking to him for nigh on an hour, and as I approached the street I lived, my hooded companion was still walking beside me. As we neared my house, I knew it was time to say farewell. I was not ignorant of the bizarreness of the situation, which concluded with this stranger nearly walking me to my doorstep. 
However, my appreciation that it was he who guided me through one of the most tumultuous episodes of my life was beyond what I'm capable of putting into words. I felt renovated. I felt reformed. I realized how selfish I would have been to have taken my own life. I realized how I needed to appreciate what I had with my wife. I realized I needed to appreciate her loyalty, and I realized I needed to appreciate my daughter. Yes, I had suffered misfortune with the untimely death of my son, but in many ways I have been infinitely more fortunate than countless others in that I have had five wonderful years with him, which will never be taken away from me. In short, I had realized the fallacy of my previous self-indulgence and self-loathing. Thank you so much for tonight. Please, will you tell me who you are so I know who I'm thanking? I pleaded. I told you before, I am a friend. So I pressed on. I honestly don't know what I would have done tonight if you hadn't turned up. I am just glad you were there. This isn't the first time I've been saved from the river. I owe you my life. I looked for some indication that this hooded stranger was preparing to reveal their identity, yet nothing was forthcoming. In exasperation, I turned away and walked towards my front door. It was then I heard the words that still haunt me. Of course I was there. I was always there. I was there when you fell in the river. I froze. I was there when your son passed away. My blood ran cold. How could this person possibly know about the death of my son? I resolved never to talk about it with anyone. I didn't even speak about it with my wife. The fact that someone I had just met could know was impossible. My exasperation turned to horror. My horror then turned quickly to blind rage. How dare this charlatan befriend me and use my son's death as a means to create a lasting impression before we parted ways. I furiously turned to face the stranger, but there was no sign of him. I ran to the end of my drive and looked up and down the road, but saw nothing. The night's events were fluctuating between the bizarre and the downright impossible. A feeling of nausea and unsteadiness came over me. My head was spinning, trying to make sense of what had occurred. I gingerly made my way to the front door. Once inside, I staggered up to the bathroom and splashed cold water on my face to clear my head. I looked in the mirror, and my gaze was met by two bloodshot eyes contained within a deathly pale face that I scarcely recognized as my own. Clearly, I was exhausted, so I made my way to the bedroom and found my wife sound asleep in bed. I couldn't wait to join her and wake up to the realization this was all some lucid, strange dream. However, in spite of my tiredness, I couldn't relax. My gaze was continually drawn to the window. The more I looked towards the window, the greater my compulsion grew to get out of bed and look out of it. Finally, I could resist this inexplicable desire no longer and found myself wandering mindlessly towards it. As I strode toward the window, I glanced at the clock. It read 3.12 a.m. Once I reached the window, I rested my chin on my hands and looked out. I wasn't looking for anything in particular. I just needed to calm my thoughts. Just as I was about to turn back to bed, something caught my eye. I could never have prepared myself for the sight that would greet me. To my disbelief, I saw Graham. He was standing on the drive, looking up at my house. When he realized he had caught my eye, he cheerily waved at me. I tentatively waved back. The reason I was unable to reciprocate his wave with equal enthusiasm was the sight of the same hooded stranger I had encountered earlier that night. Stood to his right, with his arm around him like an old friend. To the other side of the hooded stranger was the figure of a young boy who could not have been older than five. He too was smiling at me. I was struck by how much he resembled my son. 
I must have fainted for the next thing I remember was my wife waking me the following morning. I have some really sad news for you, darling. It's about Graham. Tears stung my eyes. I already knew what she was going to say. I'm so sorry. I know he was your best friend, she continued. What time did he pass away, I asked. The doctor says it must have been between 3 a.m., 3.30 a.m. The statement hit me like a train. The pieces in my mind started to fall into place. How the stranger had known about my near-death experience in the river all those years ago. How it had known about my son's death. And how it had known that last night was not my time. The hooded stranger was none other than death itself. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights 